heartbreaking when we do what we believe are all the right things for our health and then one day we find out that all those things we thought were so good for us are actually making things worse. And one that's causing a lot of confusion right now is the debate about oxalate. All of a sudden, over the past couple of years, it seems like there's so many messages out there saying suddenly don't eat kale, don't eat so many greens, worry about all the oxalate content of these foods. Now, if you're anything like me, and I suspect you are if you're watching this video, you tend to think that leafy green foods are absolutely awesome. And you include them in your juices and in your smoothies, and you believe that they're doing a ton of good for your body and your energy. So this message that oxalates in these green foods are no good for you is confusing, conflicting, and it's frustrating. And if there's anything we need less of when it comes to our health, it's confusing and conflicting advice. So today I want to clear all of this up for you, remove the confusion and give you the truth about the issue with oxalate. I want you to be able to move forward with confidence and know what you're doing for your body is awesome and it's not doing more harm than good. Hi, I'm Ross Bridgeford. I'm the creator of the Alkaline Reset Cleanse, the founder of LiveEnergized.com. And in this video today, I'm gonna to end the debate on kale and spinach and all of these other oxalate containing foods. I'm gonna be answering the question mark that's come up in the past year or so, more so than before, about whether we should be worried about foods that are containing oxalate and whether this is damaging and deleterious for our kidneys and particularly for our thyroid. It's so important when you're putting in a huge amount of effort with your health that you're feeling really confident in the choices that you're making. So as a background and as a little bit of a, a, a primer on what oxalates are, I'm going to dig into the why about the debate and I'm going to let you know the foods that are containing these oxalates. And then we're going to uncover what the truth is. We're going to have a quick look at these oxalate containing foods now and then we're going to uncover the absolute truth as to whether this is something you really do need to be worried about. So real quick, here's a list of some of those oxalate containing foods up on the screen now. Foods that you would often be eating in an alkaline based diet, things like kale and spinach and beetroot, most leafy greens. You can see there's a bunch of stuff in there we'd never eat on an alkaline diet anyway, but a lot of these foods are pretty abundant in my diet. And in my alkaline reset cleanse, we're juicing and smoothing and souping these daily and we're feeling amazing. But we keep being told they're bad for us. So what is going on? And what is oxalate? Oxalate is a small molecule that is found in plants, particularly those that I just listed above. Now, if you love the science of it, oxalate is actually something that is made of two carbons and four oxygen with a charge of negative two, which means it's attracted to other molecules with a charge of positive two. Now, this is important because this means it's attracted to calcium and to a lesser extent, magnesium. So when we ingest it through certain plant foods, but more importantly, when our bodies make a lot of oxalate as an end product of metabolism, and especially metabolizing fructose, and more on that in a minute, our bodies have to be able to deal with it and excrete it. Our bodies do not use oxalate in any way. They don't degrade it. It has to be eliminated out of the body through our urine and our feces. And so this is really, really important. Even if oxalate intake is absolutely zero, even if you completely 100% eliminate all oxalate containing foods on earth from your diet, oxalate will still be present in your body and it will still need to be excreted in your urine as a result just of your normal metabolism and your normal bodily functioning. In other words, you can have all the oxalate issues in the world even if you eat no oxalate containing foods. Now, before we get too far into that debate, it's important for you to know that your body will have oxalate in it no matter what you eat. Your body just has to be able to deal with the oxalate. It has to be able to manage it, remember that part. Now, I talk a lot about balances in the body and this is just another really, 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 really good example of that. Your body has to maintain all of its delicate balances. It has to balance the careful mechanisms that are in your body that are designed to be able to deal with and eliminate the oxalate. So what are the problems with the oxalate if your body can't deal with it? Now the theory that we're being told is because these foods such as kale and spinach and beets and so on are much, much higher in oxalate than other foods, they can lead to a number of issues within the body. Now these is issues are most often discussed as kidney stone formation and thyroid function. Now, Anyone who's got either of these issues has probably been freaking out for the past couple of years because we've been thinking all along, we've been told to eat loads of vegetables, we've been told to eat loads of leafy greens, but all of a sudden, 
these leafy greens are now being told to us that it's making it worse. The theory is that we, if we are consuming oxalate containing foods, then our body's gonna be overrun with oxalate and there's gonna to be too much in there for our body to be out of handle and therefore it's gonna cause issues. Now, issues including it not being able to get bound up properly and getting clogged and causing kidney stones or crystallizing in the thyroid and causing thyroid issues. These are the common things we're talking about when people are worried about oxalate. Now, aside from this, there is a condition called hyperoxaluria, which has got both primary and enteric versions. So the primary hyperoxaluria is actually just a genetic condition that affects about one in every million people. So that's quite irrelevant to the amount of kale that you're eating. The other one is actually the result of a digestive disorder. So enteric is, a, is the result of a condition such as leaky gut or Crohn's. And in which case, the consumption of leafy greens is absolutely not the issue here. The issue when you've got a digestive disorder or an inflammatory condition such as leafy gut is actually with the consumption of foods like sugar and gluten and processed foods, all of those acidic foods that we're always talking about avoiding that cause these autoimmune, these inflammatory conditions. And it's the condition that's preventing the proper expelling of the oxalate. If you've got one of these types of conditions, an inflammatory gut condition or a digestive disorder, you really need to be consuming more leafy greens so that you can recover and heal the autoimmune condition, not restricting greens. That's the worst thing you can be doing here. So the bottom line here is that the conditions that lead to the body not being able to properly excrete oxalate are not being caused by eating oxalate. They're imbalances that are elsewhere in the body that are more often than not caused by eating a crappy standard Western diet of sugar and gluten and processed foods that have actually got little to no greens, low levels of vegetables, too much junk food, not enough water, too much acidity, too much inflammatory foods. And it is actually the sickness, disease and imbalance of this type of lifestyle that is creating the environment in your body that is meaning that it's not able to deal with the oxalate and do its job properly. These inflammatory conditions, autoimmune conditions, endocrine conditions, and even if you ate zero oxalate, your body would still not be able to deal with the volume of oxalate that's created just every day through your normal bodily functioning. Now, especially given that the metabolism of these acidic foods actually creates way, way, way more oxalate than the metabolism of healthier, sugar-free, chemical-free, additive-free, alkaline-forming foods, that is a really important issue to note. We have to address the root cause here. We have to address the root cause. Just cutting out oxalate containing foods isn't addressing the cause. It's just treating the symptom. It's a fuzzy logic kind of way of looking at it. It's similar to treat, taking a drug to treat symptoms instead of addressing what's actually causing the problem in the first place. You're only going to ever be slightly masking the symptoms if you reduce these oxalate containing foods. You're actually going to be getting you nowhere near fixing the problem. I want you to have the truth and I want to clear the confusion for you. And I also want you to know that everything that I do, everything that I publish on Live Energized, everything I coach to my clients, everyone in the membership of the Alkaline Base Camp, the people who go through my Alkaline Reset Cleanse, all of the people that I coach, I want you to know one thing. Everything on this site is evidence-based. It's tried and tested on myself and thankfully my willing family. But most importantly, it's rooted in the scientific study and the data, the hard data. And that's what makes this debate so interesting because while there's a huge amount of so-called experts telling us that all of a sudden after all this time, kale is suddenly bad for us, beets are suddenly bad for us, spinach is suddenly bad for us, there's actually massive, massive holes in that theory and there is practically zero scientific data or research to back it up. As ever, conventional mainstream nutrition advice focuses on the short-term symptom masking, i.e. very, very similar to the pharmaceutical industry. There's a big link there. But rather than getting to the real issue, they just focus on that fuzzy logic, what's gonna make a good headline kind of thing for my website. I'm absolutely keen for any debate and having my opinion changed always by actual evidence and data. But until then, I want you guys to know, please do not stop eating these oxalate containing foods. When it comes to the research, there seems to be some really, really compelling evidence to show that the amount of oxalate consumed doesn't have any impact on the likelihood of you experiencing any form of oxalate-based condition whatsoever. By far, 
the biggest precursor to oxalate-based conditions is having a pre-existing digestive disorder or an autoimmune condition, things like Crohn's or IBS or leaky gut and so on. Or if you're unfortunate enough to have a genetic condition such as cystic fibrosis or the hyperoxaluria that we mentioned earlier. There is absolutely no research with controlled large groups that's able to show any evidence that a high oxalate diet is any more of a risk than a low oxalate diet for kidney stones or thyroid issues. In fact, the biggest determinants from the research appear to be just a handful of things. Number one, fat malabsorption. So people with inflammatory digestive conditions such as Crohn's or leaky gut are at a much, much greater risk of suffering from fat malabsorption. And this is often caused by the, the high gluten consumption in our modern diet. And the body's inability to absorb fat dramatically impacts its ability to excrete oxalate. So that's number one. Factor number two is fructose consumption. So the metabolism of fructose produces a lot more oxalate than eating any number of oxalate rich foods. And in the US particularly, fructose consumption is off the charts because you guys over there have got high fructose corn syrup in practically every packaged foods. But it also comes from regular sugar as well, which is 40% fructose. Things like honey and maple syrup and brown sugar, these are also 40% fructose. So if you're in any degree of packaged foods at the moment, your fructose consumption is likely way higher than it should be. And this is likely a big contributor to oxalate type issues. Factor number three is a poor diet in general, i.e. a diet that is low in magnesium and calcium consumption. So in several of the studies, the researchers saw big kinks in their data due to the magnesium and calcium spikes in the controlled diets of their participants. So in a 2008 study, researchers gave participants either a low oxalate omnivore diet, a low oxalate vegetarian diet, or a high oxalate vegetarian diet. And the results after the study completed showed a lower oxalate impact in the body from the high oxalate vegetarian diet than in any of the low oxalate diets. Why? Because the high oxalate vegetarian diet also contained high levels of magnesium and calcium from all the vegetables that were being consumed. Similarly, in a 2014 study, 57 participants were randomly assigned to either a DASH style diet, which is a pretty regular kind of vegetarian diet that's very high in vegetables, or a low oxalate diet. And they found that the low oxalate diet made absolutely zero difference to oxalate accretion. But the DASH diet had a huge impact. Again, expected due to the increased magnesium and calcium ingestion, the DASH diet actually changed the way the body was able to deal with and excrete oxalate and it had a huge impact on those oxalate-based conditions. All of the research that I've found has pointed to these factors. Oxalates are an issue if you have got one, a rare genetic condition, to an autoimmune or an inflammatory condition, especially a digestive condition brought on by a poor diet and lifestyle. And the way out of that, of course, is to eat a lot more greens, even those high oxalate containing greens. Or three, a diet that is rich in fructose, i.e. sugar. We're not talking about fruit. We're talking about sugar containing the fructose. So the research also showed that a high oxalate diet doesn't make things worse. The urinary excretion of oxalate is similar on a high oxalate diet or on a low oxalate diet. However, those high oxalate foods that the media has been reveling in trying to demonize over these past couple of years, spinach and kale, these are so potent at reversing these digestive disorders, these autoimmune and inflammatory conditions that you would be absolutely crazy to exclude them. The message is simple, treat the root cause, not the symptoms. Eliminate sugar and gluten as much as you possibly can. This is really, really important in getting to the root of those digestive conditions. Eat a diet rich in vegetables, regardless of their oxalate content. The kidneys love leafy greens. The thyroid needs leafy greens. Ensure that you're getting adequate intake of those really, really important alkaline minerals. We're talking magnesium and calcium in particular, but also potassium and sodium. And then of course, as ever, lots and lots of hydration. If you've ever got any risk or worry of kidney stones or thyroid issues, dehydration is hugely detrimental. Again, when you see hype, 
don't believe the hype unless you've peeled back a few of the layers, looked at the facts and found the research that, that stands by that as evidence. People have loved writing headlines about kale over the last few years suddenly being the worst food around because it gets them lots of attention and it gets them lots of traffic to their website. But there is no fact behind that hype. There is nothing about leafy green foods that will ever be bad for you. So. Thank goodness we've actually got that one out of the way. The guys on my seven day juice challenge over the past couple of weeks have been juicing tons and tons and tons of greens and they are getting amazing results. They're absolutely flying. They're getting more energy, clearer skin, healed digestion, weight lost, weight gained, but the good type of weight gain like muscle. They're getting up early. They're feeling energized. It's amazing what greens can do for you. It's amazing what juicing can do for you. So be on the lookout because the results that those guys have got from just seven days of having a single juice every day have been so powerful. I'm now moving on to my next free training, which is teaching you how to do the alkaline cleanse. In the next couple of weeks, you'll see a few emails from me and then we'll be getting started with a brand new, completely free three part series teaching you the ins and outs of how to do an alkaline cleanse. It's something that is actually quite tricky to do if you're just trying to do it from scratch. It's something you can easily get very, very wrong and it makes it a thousand times harder than it needs to be. So. For the first time ever, I'm gonna be running this workshop for you totally free. It's gonna be a three part alkaline cleanse workshop. It's gonna teach you everything you need to do, everything you should not do, all the types of foods you should be including, the types of recipes, what you should be on the lookout for every day. It's gonna make it really easy for you and it's gonna enable you to make that happen, clear out your body and start getting some amazing results. So until then, if you're excited about doing that cleanse workshop, let me know in the comments below this video. Any questions, let me know this video. If you wanna do the juice challenge still, it can still be done, it's still up there, let me know. Let's get started, let's just get some momentum going. I can't wait to start teaching more of this stuff to you guys, it's gonna be amazing. Until then, I'll see you in the comments and have a fantastic day. I'll speak to you all soon.